What is God? I've had discussions with people, some of them atheists, and the question comes up eventually, what is God? What do we mean by the word God? In this video, I'm going to discuss an uncommon answer to that question. Although this view of God is uncommon, it's found in the writings of many theologians and appears in many world religions, as we'll see. Of course, the most common view of God is God as a person. Either Jesus or Krishna, who incarnated and were actually human people, or some heavenly person like Yahweh, God the Father. And the reason why they're persons is that they have desires and wishes. And it says in the Bible once that, that Yahweh got angry and jealous. And so they have personal characteristics. The view of God as a person is very natural. It can be understood even by a young child. The young child creates in their mind, I think, a hierarchy of existence. On the bottom is dumb matter. You hit a brick, it doesn't cry, it doesn't feel pain. Above that is matter that a child pretends has life, like a toy. The child pretends the toy is alive, talks to the to toy, talks to the doll. Above that are animals that really do have life but they're inferior to the child in knowledge and ability. The child can do things and know things that the animal can't. The child can do mathematics, two plus two is four. Then above animals are peers, or other children, who are similar to the child in knowledge and ability. And of course, there are older children, but let's go next to adults, like parents, who are superior to the child in knowledge and ability. Adults can do things that kids can't, like they can drive cars, and adults know things that, that kids don't know. So it's natural to imagine that above that is a being who has infinite knowledge and infinite ability, and that's God, and that's God as a person. Well, once you decide that God is a person, which person? On Earth, there have been hundreds, perhaps thousands, of gods that people have created in their minds. This is the Viking god Odin. This is the Hindu god Hanuman. That's Jesus, of course. Here are some Egyptian gods, some Greek gods, etc. We could even have gods on another planet. There are actually more stars in the known universe than more grains of sand on the earth. Look it up, that's literally true. So we can imagine a planet where there's beings that look like rabbits, but they're intelligent. This is a little video that builds on that idea. Giordano's time is at hand. Giordano Bruno Rabbit says the judge, you stand accused of blasphemy, how say you? Giordano rises, nods to the judge, and then faces the jury. Honorable judge, members of the jury, what I have to say is hard but true. God is not a rabbit. Pandemonium, shouts. Members of the jury with noses twitching furiously. He admits the charge, shouts the prosecutor. Why listen to more blasphemy when his own words convict? Finally, the court comes to order. Giordano Rabbit stiffens. He will speak the truth no matter the cost. Hear me, good rabbits. We know today that the great mother rabbit, holy be her name, did not begin the world by birthing a million rabbits from her blessed womb. She allowed natural processes to produce us in time. And speaking of time, we know our planet is billions of years old, not thousands. He denies she and her holy writings, shouts the prosecutor, stamping his hind legs. His guilt is plain. What need is there to hear more? It is my right, says Giordano. I will not be denied. All look to the judge. After a long pause, he says, you may continue, Giordano Bruno Rabbit, but I would advise the defendant to be mindful of the consequences. Those who deny the truth have more to fear than those who declare it, says Giordano defiantly. 
the courtroom falls silent. Finally, in a pleading, conciliatory tone, Giordano continues. Good rabbits, hear my words. When our species was in its infancy, our great mother rabbit, holy be her name, allowed various stories to circulate, stories which gave us a warm, snug egg for our minds to inhabit. But in seeking the truth, we've learned better. We've seen the cracks in the egg, and we've seen through to the wondrous world beyond, a world vast beyond measure, teeming with wonders yet to be discovered. Some of us have come to see the great mother rabbit as a personification of something infinitely greater, infinitely more wondrous. But others have grown too accustomed to their snug mental cocoon, so they seal the cracks. They make an idol of the holy writings and reject the vast, wonderful truth, clinging to ancient truth, which erodes daily before our very eyes. God takes the form of a rabbit to accommodate us. Do not the arachnids say their God spun the web of the entire universe from herself? But God is infinitely beyond arachnid ideas and infinitely beyond rabbit ideas. She, or he, or it, I know not which, awaits our discovery. We need only venture outside our egg into the wonderful sunlight of truth and follow the truth as best we are able. We must put away childish things and enough interrupts the judge. Giordano Bruno Rabbit, the jury will now decide your fate. And may our great mother rabbit, holy be her name, have mercy on your soul. Well, we can think of God as a person, as the great fluffy rabbit who happened to be born on another planet. But is there a better idea of God rather than this idea that multiplies gods? Is there a better idea of God? God is one, right? Well, let's look at our hierarchy and go in the other direction. Inanimate matter is made of molecules, which are made of atoms, which are made of quarks. Do we ever reach bottom? Do we ever reach an uh, ultimate foundation? Something that is the foundation of the existence of quarks and atoms and molecules and matter and people and the entire universe. So, do we ever reach an ultimate level, an ultimate foundation? Well, that's what science trajectory is aimed towards. It's aimed towards finding a single fundamental entity which underlies all existence. The number of atoms in the universe is estimated to be 10 to the 80th power. Atoms on Earth, less, 10 to the 50th. Uh, I read once there were about 10 million different types of molecules on Earth. But those molecules are all composed of 118 elements, which, according to the standard model of physics, are composed of 17 fundamental particles. 
Now, the standard model of physics doesn't include gravity, so if we throw in gravity, space-time, let's throw in dark energy, dark matter, we get up to 21 fundamental entities. That's an enormous reduction from 10 to the 80th power. And it's easy to imagine that someday we'll reach a single fundamental entity. But does it make sense to call that God? Well, theologians have said that God is subsistent being itself and have called God the ultimate ground of existence. Now this idea may seem odd, but as I say, it occurs in the writing of theologians and in world religions, as we're going to see. We're going to see several examples. Now to be clear, we're, spoken, we're speaking about two different conceptions of God. There's the person who transcends the universe, our Father, the person who art in heaven. Not here, but somewhere else. We are talking about an idea that's diametrically opposed. We're talking about an impersonal entity. It's not a person because it's the whole universe. It's not a part of the universe, so it can't be a person. And it's imminent in the universe. It's the ground of the universe. It's not somewhere else. It's here. Now, there are other ideas that we could talk about, but we won't. This is enough. Talk about these two. And we're focusing on this idea of God. Well, let's see some theologians who say that God is ultimate ground of existence. Uh, here's a rather famous theologian currently writing, currently alive, and here are all his distinctions, which you can pause and read if you're interested. Now, he writes a book, he wrote a book in 2013 called The Experience of God, Being, Consciousness, Bliss, and he says, the definition of God I offer can be found in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Vedanta, uh, Hinduism, and uh, Bhakti, Hinduism. Sikhism, and even argues it can be found in Buddhism and in Taoism. So he says, God is not only ultimate reality. That's what we're talking about, ultimate reality. When you drill down matter, when you go down, 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 if you reach bottom, that is ultimate. And he says it's the primordial reality. Well, again, primordial. And apart from this reality, we have no experience of anything whatsoever. So it's the basis of everything we experience. At this point, I want to do a dis disclaimer. I am discussing the idea of God as ultimate ground of existence, or subsistent being itself. And I'm going to present quotations that suggest the same idea. The authors I cite may not agree with me 100%. I don't mean to misrepresent anyone. So I provide the quotes, and anyone is free to drill down, read that whole book. Maybe I, I'm, uh, maybe the, the author wouldn't agree with me entirely. Now, but so what? Well, if someone is interested in God and ways to think about God and to relate to God and even to worship God, then what I have to say may be of interest. You can take these ideas and make them your own. Decide what to keep. Decide what to discard. Okay. I'm just some guy on the internet. Uh, there's no reason why you should accept what I say is uh, gospel. Viewers have to decide for themselves what to accept and what to reject. This is, disclaimer is especially important because now we're going to see a few authors who are deceased, so they couldn't uh, disagree with what I say. Okay, Paul Tillich was one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century. Throughout his work, he had a view of God as being itself as the ground of being. That's a little, um, is God being itself, or is God the ground, the foundation of being? That's, that's, uh, that's a good question. He was critical of conceptions of God as a being. That means a person, a separate being, separate from the rest of creation. He was also critical of pantheistic conceptions of God, which what I'm presenting could be uh, said to be a form of pantheism. So we won't get into that. I'm just going to continue presenting my idea, but there's various threads here that could be followed in another video. Okay. 
Aldous Huxley was considered one of the foremost intellectuals of his time. He wrote a book called The Perennial Philosophy. And um, the book, the book Perennial Philosophy is, is a very, very interesting book. I'd recommend it. However, what I'm going to quote is an introduction that Aldous Huxley wrote to another book. So this book has an introduction. And there, Aldous Huxley is talking about the perennial philosophy. And he says, more than 25 centuries have passed. And perennial philosophy has been committed to writing. He says that he finds the ideas of the perennial philosophy in Vedanta, in Hebrew prophecy, in Taoism, Platonic dialogues, the gospel according to St. John. Mahayana theology is a Buddhist. Plotinus was a Neoplatonic philosopher. Uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, uh, Persian uh, Sufis. Sufis are Islamic mystics, Christian mystics, etc., etc. So he is claiming that the following ideas have been found in many, many religions and theological systems. Well, what are the ideas? At the core of the perennial philosophy, we find four fundamental doctrines. The first one is what we're talking about. The, fundam the phenomenal world of matter and individualized consciousness is a manifestation of a divine ground within which all partial realities have their being and apart from which they would be non-existent. Well, if God is the ultimate ground of existence, without that ground, there would be no existence. Well, Huxley goes on to say that uh, according to the perennial philosophy, this idea found in so many of the world's religions, we are capable not merely of knowing about the divine ground, the ultimate ground of existence, but we can have a direct experience of it. He says, realize, it, realize its existence by a direct intuition. Uh, that's mysticism. Mystics try to have a direct experience of God, however they conceive God, and some of them conceive God as ultimate ground of existence. And this goes on here to say that uh, man's, uh, meaning people's life on earth, has the real purpose of our life is to identify and become united with uh, our divine ground. In Eastern Orthodox Christianity, there's something called hesychasm. And I find it interesting. Now, of course, hesychasm is part of Christianity and um, they phrase all their beliefs in terms of Christianity, but they have this idea of uncreated light. Now, uncreated means eternal. It was never a time when it came into existence. And they believe, the, the monks of the Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, believe that they can have a direct experience of uncreated light. They identified that light with an incident in the Bible. There was a, Jesus was transfigured on Mount Tabor and he, he shone with an uncreated light. But the important point is for me that they claim to have a direct experience of God and the direct experience of God takes the form of an experience of uncreated light. If you want to read more about this, here's a book I um, would recommend. And Here's a quote from the book from page 120, and it talks about the light on Mount Tabor is uncreated and what God grants to the Christian uh, in the sacraments, according to Christianity, is uncreated divine light, deification. Now, that has to do with some mystics believe that eventually they just merge and fall into that uh, divine light and become one with it. And since the divine uncreated light is God, that could be called deification. That's kind of a very uh, far out po concept, but it, it appears in Eastern Orthodoxy. You can check it out. All right, um, one more theologian. This is Meister Eckhart. He was a Christian, a Dominican uh, theologian. And he says that God possesses being. Let's think of it as existence. Creatures do not possess existence in and of themselves, but they receive it derivatively from God. Outside God, there is pure nothingness. Well, you could see how if there is an ultimate ground of existence, 
aside from that, which grounds all existence, there's nothing. Because all existence is grounded in that. Um, Urquhart used the idea of, the, or used the concept of the Godhead, which is similar to our idea of ultimate ground of existence. And when he says God and the Godhead are as distinct as heaven and earth, what he's saying is a point we'll come back to later, that he was using God here to mean person gods. And what he's saying is person gods and the ultimate ground of distinct of, of existence what he's saying is that person gods and the ultimate ground of existence are as distinct as heaven and earth. They're not the same thing. We'll get back to that point. And here's something that a writer attributes or says that Eckhart says. The Godhead is a universal and eternal unity. So the ultimate ground of existence contains within itself, in a sense, all diversity, because it's the ground of all diversity, it's the ground of all existence. Um, existence is God. Well, this, I, I show this because there, there's this woman monk, uh, her name is here, who has created lots of very high quality videos, and I'd r really recommend uh, watching some of her videos on YouTube if you're at all uh, interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, these links appear in, in the notes to this video as well as being on the screen. Let's move now on to Spinoza, who was a philosopher of the 1600s. And he says, God is not he who is, but that which is. This is basically saying God is not a person, not a he, not a she, but a that. Okay. Einstein said he believed in Spinoza's God who reveals himself in the lawful, lawful harmony of the world, not in a God who concerns himself with the fate and doings of mankind. And here's also another quote from Einstein, that Spinoza's God is his God, is Einstein's God. He meets him in, he sees the universe as a manifestation of that God. And Einstein says his religion is cosmic and universal. His God is universal. Now, if you think about it, any person God is not universal. Of all the planets in the universe, Jesus is only known on Earth. The great furry rabbit that we hypothesized earlier it is only known on that planet. But the ultimate ground of existence would be accessible to any intelligent being anywhere, at least conceptually. Actual experience at the ultimate ground of existence is another matter. That takes some work, apparently. Also, uh, I mentioned Vedanta earlier, and Vedanta, non dual Vedanta, is a Hindu philosophy and religion, and its foundational principle is the oneness of ultimate reality. Uh, what we're calling ultimate ground of existence could be called Brahman, or I mean, could be identified with what. Uh, Vedanta calls Brahman. So, let's sum up here. Our view is that the world is a manifestation of what we could call uncreated light, energy, whatever, ultimate ground of existence, and that that's what we are. That is what existence is. By the way, it's interesting that there's actually uh, a scientific theory that the universe is a hologram. Well, if it, if it was a hologram, it seems to me this would say that it's made out of one thing. A hologram is made out of light. And in that light, we see images. And that's an analogy to what we're saying God is. So what does this mean for God's who are persons? What does it mean for them? Uh, Swami Vivekananda is another, is a, was a Hindu monk of the Vedanta tradition, and he said, the impersonal God, the ultimate ground of existence, Brahman, seeing through the mist of sense is personal. Now, the way I prefer, would phrase a similar idea is that gods who are persons are personifications of the true God. A God who is a person is a personification of the ultimate ground of existence. 
And there are many personifications, as we've seen. So getting back to the idea of the universe as a hologram, as a creation of one thing, we can say that God is the creator. The uncreated light is the creator. Any image is a creature, a creation. Personal gods are creations. Therefore, they are images. Therefore, they are creatures, as is absolutely everything except the one, except God. But it must be emphasized that creator is used not in the sense of a workman who builds a home. That's the, uh, the, the normal idea of God as a person. God made the universe and is separate from it. Just like a, a carpenter could build a table and is separate from it. Our idea is that the universe, each and every moment, is like the spray of a water fountain. Each and every moment, the water creates and maintains the spray. And similarly, each and every moment, the existence of everything we see depends on the existence of the foundation, of the ultimate ground of existence of God. Okay, here's some of the music you've been listening to. And thank you for watching.